We're here today at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City on August 12th, 2008. We're with James Allspa, who was born December 13th, 1943. He lives in Cherubusco, Indiana. He served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. He, his highest rank was an E-5. Good afternoon, Mr. Allspot. Good afternoon. Um, you, 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 first off, were you enlisted or were you drafted? I was drafted. You were drafted. Mm -hmm. And where were you living when you were drafted? I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, I was married at the time. My wife and I had been married approximately a year and a half. And we had no children, and they started to take married people with no children. So I was uh, drafted, uh, like I guess I had been married about a year and a half. And how old were you then? I was, uh, that was in 66, I was 22 at the time. 22 at the time. You had you were married but didn't have any children. Married but no children. Um, what, what was your occupation then? I worked for International Harvester in Fort Wayne. I hired her right out of high school when I was 18. And I had been there a little over four years when I was drafted. Did you expect to be drafted? Yes, uh, I knew my number was coming up. And, uh, but there's really not much you can do about it. I didn't want to enlist. My, uh, my father uh, did, asked me not to enlist because his brother was missing in the Second World War. And uh, he was uh, missing in action, never returned. So he was a little adamant about me not uh, joining the military. He said, if they want you, they'll come and get you. They know where you're at. So. Uh, do you remember the day that you received your letter? Uh, yes, my wife and I were living in an apartment in Fort Wayne and uh, we were both working. And, uh, she got home from work early and she said, you got a letter from the Selective Service Board. And I thought, well, maybe it's reclassifying me. And then I opened it up and it said, greetings, your friends and neighbors have chosen you. And I still have that letter at home. Well, how did the draft work in 1966? I understand you said your number was coming up, but what did you yes, mean by that? Yes, uh, the local boards had a certain quota to meet. Uh, I don't think they went actually to a number until maybe later on in the 70s at the end of the draft. Uh, but the local boards had a certain quota that they had to meet every month. And there was people that I worked with that were in a lo another local board that were not drafted. Uh, even though they were older, and even though they were married. Uh, they were not drafted, and here I was drafted. Uh, you had to sign up for the draft, and you was 18, and you were given a draft card. And then they took people out of the local boards. They, uh, I don't know how they picked or choose who went, but uh, I happened to be one of the lucky or unlucky ones, whichever way you look at it. Okay, so you, you had your letter, you were told to report where? Report to uh, the Pogston Arms building in downtown Fort Wayne. That was a selective service board. I had to report there, I believe it was August uh, 15th, about 2 o'clock in the morning. And from there we were put on a bus and taken to Indianapolis to the uh, draft bureau down there and we were given a physical. And then from there we were sent to Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. And they didn't let you come back here in between? No. Well, when I got on the bus, I was that was in August, and I didn't come back home until uh, December of that year. And we you said you went down to basic training, what kind of, um, I mean, what did the, all that entail when you went to basic training? What are the kind of things you had to do? Basic training was just your, uh, just basic military indoctrination. You know, you were taught how to march, uh, how to dress, uh, of course, how to fire weapons, uh, military justice, uh, just everything military, you were, everything civilian was taken away from you and uh, basically you were just taught how to be in the military and we were housed in old World War II wooden barracks when I was down there in basic training. And did, did they give you any other than basic training, did you get other, any other training at that time to teach you some kind of skill or craft or? No, none no. whatsoever. I did take a driver's training course down there uh, learn how to drive a Jeep and a truck and so forth and that was uh, probably what got me my job when I got sent to Vietnam was the fact I had a military driver's license. Did you go right from the basic to, to Vietnam? No, uh, I left basic in uh, 
probably September, October, probably October, and they put us on a troop train and sent us to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And Fort Polk was basically infantry training to prepare you for Vietnam. If you went to Fort Polk, your next duty station would be Vietnam. And they rushed us through the training down at Fort Polk so they could get us home in time for Christmas leave so we could be in Vietnam in January. So uh, I was out at Fort Polk until probably the, about the middle of December and then I got my leave and then I came home for two weeks and then I was sent overseas. I was sent to Oakland Army Terminal in Oakland, California for a couple of days and then I got on a plane at Travis Air Force Base and uh, we ended up flying to Wake Island in uh, the Philippines and then into Benoit Air Base in uh, outside Saigon. And um, from there, where did you go? From there, I was sent to the 90th Replacement Depot at Long Bend, which is a large military complex. And then I was sent down into Mekong Delta to a place called the 9th Infantry Division. And it was a base camp out in the middle of the, the boonies. There were just rice paddies all around. And uh, I spent the whole year in Vietnam in that base camp, yeah. working in, in that can you tell us some of the things that happened while you were there? Uh, I was rather fortunate when I got there. There was about six or eight of us guys from Fort Wayne that were kind of stuck together through the whole thing. And uh, we ended up at the 9th Infantry Division. And all the guys that I was with got sent to line outfits and they got sent to tank outfits or uh, armor personnel carriers and so forth. Because I had a military driver's license, and because I had some carpentry experience, I was sent to work in a mess hall. And they needed a carpenter and they needed a truck driver to haul the rations from the ration point to the mess hall. So it wasn't a cushy job. There was people that had it better and there was people that had it worse. Uh, but I was not involved in combat. Uh, we slept in a tent on a cot in a dirt floor, and when it rained, the water ran out through the middle of the floor. Uh, was it like that the whole year you were there? About the first three or four months, okay. and then we built semi-permanent barracks, which got us up off the ground. And uh, the mess hall, we worked seven days a week. Pro probably, I'm thinking I got up about six in the morning and uh, probably got to bed at nine or ten at night, and it was a seven-day-a-week job because the people have to eat seven days and uh, but at least I was I was eating warm food and uh, I was sleeping dry. Anything else there you have to say about being uh, Oh a typical day would be like I would get up at six o'clock in the morning and then I would go to chow and mess all and then I would go get the truck and the water trailer I had to fill a water trailer because we had no running water. I had to fill a water trailer and bring that back. Then I had to help the cooks and help the dining room orderly uh, set up for the day's lunch. And then in the afternoon, I would go down to a place called Ration Breakdown. And I went to provide, or to get the uh, food for the next day's meal. We would get the, the dry food and the meat and the bread and so forth. Uh, I would get all that for the next day's meal and then I would bring it back and put it in the coolers or put it in the containers and then I would clean up and then I would help to serve the evening meal. Oh, what was evening. that food like? Uh, our food was pretty good. We were serving officers mm -hmm. so we had cooks that knew how to take the regular food. We got the regular, the same food that the regular troops got only these, these cooks, they were uh, career military people they knew how to fix it and they knew how to spice it up to make it a little bit more palatable than what the, you know, the normal, normal, the normal, normal food yeah. was. Uh, we had no fresh milk uh, the time I was there. That was not uh, something that we had. Is that just not something that you have in Vietnam? or No, no there was no fresh milk available. There probably was maybe in Saigon or something. But we had no fresh milk and we had no hot showers. It was cold showers and... and uh, they had what they call a powdered milk, but they used that in cooking only. It was pretty hard to drink. Mm -hmm. So you drank water or you drank uh, juice or soda. There was always that available there. 
Uh, our base camp was located probably 20 miles southeast of Saigon. Um, like I say, it was out in the middle of a rice paddy and it was basically a mile square uh, base camp with semi-permanent buildings. Most of them were tents. And then as I was there a while, then they start building semi-permanent structures, wooden structures. We had to pull berm guards, so about, oh, every two weeks you'd have to go out on guard duty. And you'd have to stay out all night in the bunker. There was usually two guys in the bunker. Uh, and then if you had any problems, you had a radio to where you would radio the officers and they would come out and, and see if there was a, any enemy present out Did there. Did everybody take a turn doing that? Yes, everybody? everyone that worked in the base camp had to had take to a turn uh, on guard duty. And of course, there were guys that came back into the base camp that were out on patrol for two or three days. They came back in for rest and recuperation called R&R. &R. And then they would go back out into the boonies. But if you worked in the base camp, you had to pull what they call berm guard. And uh, that was usually about 3 o'clock in the afternoon till about 7 o'clock the next morning. Uh, there was about eight or nine of us guys that worked in the mess hall. There was a mess sergeant and two cooks. They were career soldiers, and then the rest of us were all draftees. I still keep in touch with two or three of the, uh, the people. I've seen them several times since I've been out. Uh, Something interesting, when we came home, uh, we got on a plane, and there was probably 250 of us, and it was a civilian plane, and the stewardess uh, got Marshall, everybody on. Marshall plane, like was a, a TWA or? Yeah, I think it was uh, TIA, it was Trans International Airlines, okay. was an But it wasn't a military? No, military it wasn't plane. a military. Okay. I went over military and came back civilian. There was probably 225 of us on the plane, and so we all got in and got buckled up, and the stewardess, uh, she says, now, uh, you guys don't seem too happy you're going home. Nobody said anything. And uh, she said, we got fresh milk on the way back. And no one said anything. And uh, she says, well, what's the matter? And the one guy stood up and he said, we haven't left yet. <laughs> Mm. So, uh, when the wheel got off the ground and everybody uh, gave out a big yell and then we broke out the fresh milk. Mm -mm. I did go to uh, Hawaii for r and &R. I flew my wife there and uh, we spent a week there uh, in Hawaii about halfway through my tour. Did, when you were um, on the base camp there, did you get any downtime there? Were you able to? Very little. Very uh, little. We went into Saigon maybe once a month to the PX to buy things that we couldn't buy in our base camp. We had a very small uh, PX there, but we did go into the PX in Saigon maybe once a month, and that was usually an all-day thing. It was only about 30 miles away. But because of the traffic, the military and the civilian traffic, and then the, the traffic in Saigon was terrible, we would usually go in and, and we would uh, go to a military uh, facility there and have lunch, and then we would go to their PX and buy the things we couldn't buy, and then we would come back in the base camp. But whenever you left the base camp, uh, you had to have what they call a shotgun, a guy riding shotgun with you. And you had to have uh, your rifles, and you had to have so many rounds of ammunition. With then, you? Oh, yes. And, and then your, your steel pot, and then your flak jacket. And, uh, yes, you had to prepare for everything before they would even let you leave the base camp. And then you had to have a paper saying where you were going, how long you were going to be gone, and what was your reason for leaving the base camp. So it was pretty much so ready you didn't to get to do too much exploring? None whatsoever. No, I did exactly. ride... Uh, a few times in a helicopter, we had a, uh, the division chaplain was the same religion that I was, I'm Catholic, and uh, on Sunday he said, if you want to ride with me, he said, I've got to serve Mass down in the uh, Delta to a couple guys and I need someone to serve Mass. So I said, well, I'll ride along. So, and then again, you have to wear your flak jacket and your M16 and 
a couple of clips of ammo, and I would ride with him, and we would go down and uh, land on these little little islands out in the rice paddy, and he would say mass for the uh, troops out there. And of course, he left the helicopter run. He said, keep it running while we're saying mass. And uh, so I did get to go down with him a few times and take a few photographs while I was up in the air. But uh, no, I didn't get much of a chance to explore. We'd go into a little village outside of our base camp maybe once a month if we needed charcoal or if we needed something like that. But no, you just didn't walk off the base and, and go exploring anywhere. And my R&R was a week in Hawaii with my wife. The military flew me there free and then I flew my wife to Hawaii. Mm. And so we spent a week there in Hawaii and uh, it was during our anniversary. Oh. So. That's nice. Um, how about the food that was, you said that the, what the military served was very good. Did you ever sample any of the local food? No, we were uh, told to try to stay away from the local food simply because you didn't know what was in it, how it was grown. Uh -huh. uh, and you tried to stay away from a lot of the local beers and a lot of the local sodas because it was rumored that they would put ground glass in the uh, in wow. the sodas and they would put needles or pins or something inside of you know say fruit or something like that so no i while i was there i never ate any of the local produce or i never went to a restaurant uh, wow. while the whole time i was there uh, about four or five days before i left Bob Hope came to our base camp, and it was my job to feed Bob Hope's crew. So I was backstage, and I fed Bob Hope's crew, and my mess sergeant fed Bob Hope in his actual entourage. And this would have been Christmas Day, 1967. <clears throat> uh, Bob had a, a restroom. Of course, we had outhouses there. We didn't have flush toilets. He had a restroom, and it was all to himself. And uh, I had finished serving Bob Hope's crew, and I saw Bob walk into his restroom. So I had a copy of Time Magazine, and it said, uh, Bob Hope comes to Vietnam. I walked over to the restroom, and I stood right outside. And uh, when he came out, I said, Mr. Hope, would you sign this for me? And so. Here's a photograph. Here's a, the book, and he signed it. Mm-hmm. So and what magazine is that? That's Time. The t a regular Time that that. Everybody it's Time. Has. It's the Asia edition. Okay. Oh, the Asian edition. The Asian oh, edition. Okay. Yeah, it's not the U.S. edition. Okay. It's the Asian edition. Uh, and uh, then it was uh, that was the 25th, and then I left on the 30th to come back to the states, but. Uh, I got to see the Bob Hope show, and uh, I got to meet Bob. Any other um, celebrities that came to see you? Uh, there was a lot of them that ate in our mess hall. Uh, there was Charlton Heston, um, Sandy Dennis, Hugh O'Brien, Martha Ray, General Westmoreland ate in our mess hall several times. Oh. Any? How how you said your mess hall? How big an area did you service? I mean, like you said, I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. this in my mind. You said that the people would um, there were people that did things at the base camp like you. That's where right. you stayed and you worked. But there were others that went out and on um, on, on um, patrols. missions and patrols mm -hmm. and things like that. How big of an area did it, did it all cover? I mean, uh, the base camp covered probably about a one mile okay. square area, and there was probably 10,000 troops in oh, that there division. Were 10, okay, in that's, that that's area. quite a few people. Yeah, when they first got there. Now, there were several mess halls. My particular mess hall was a commanding general's mess hall. Okay. And he was a commanding general of the 9th Division, which okay. there was 10,000 people underneath him. And the only people that ate in the mess hall in the commanding general's mess hall was his staff. So there was nothing less than a major. It was majors on up to... So on the base you know, camp there were other mess halls for the enlisted... Definitely. Enlisted other mess halls for, for different 
you know, like it was uh, division headquarters mess hall, and there was other different units that were within the 9th yeah, division that had their own mess hall. But our particular mess hall, we served about 35 to 40 officers. Uh, we served the general himself, two star, and then he had two one star generals underneath him and several colonels and majors and so forth. And anyone that visited the 9th division ate at the general's mess hall nice. because it was probably the nicest mess hall. We had Irish linen tablecloths and we had fresh salad and uh, we had stateside ice cream flown in for the general's birthday party. And okay. uh, it was basically our job to uh, make him happy and keep his belly full yeah. and, and we did that. And he in turn rewarded us by not sending us out into the field and everybody in there uh, made rank real fast. Uh, we all worked hard and we all worked together and uh, we all came home. Uh, coming home, uh, we left on the 30th of December. We stopped in Japan, we stopped in Alaska, and then back to Travis Air Force Base in, Cal in California, San Francisco. And then I processed through at uh, Oakland Army Terminal, the same place I had left from. And I was in Vietnam uh, just 51 weeks, just shy of a year. Uh, came back to Fort Wayne and uh, got back into uh, Bearfield Airport in New Year's Eve. And uh, then I had about two weeks off and then my wife and I went to Fort Hood, Texas. And that's where I finished up my military time with the 2nd Armored Division. And uh, we lived in government housing down there. And I drove a truck and I hauled rations when I was down there, just basically like I did uh, when I was in And your wife was able to join you there? Yes. Yeah, she went with me. And uh, we were only down there about eight months. But it was a good time for us. So uh, I did bring a, a weapon back with me. I'll kind of hold it up so That's you can fine. scan it. Uh, this was one of several thousand weapons that were found. It was the world's largest arms cache and it was found outside our base camp in October 1967. Uh, it was 13 miles east of Bearcat, which is the base camp that I was in. They found 1140 weapons, 95,000 small arm rounds, 3,600 grenades, 2,200 recoilless rifle shells, 452 mortar rounds, four 85 millimeter howitzers. The tunnel complexes were 35 foot deep and there were three to five levels that were four to six foot deep. Uh, the outfit that found it was part of the 9th Division and they had followed an enemy through the jungle and all of a sudden he disappeared. And they looked where he disappeared and there was a small, what they call a spider hole. So they sent a man uh, down in the spider hole, they were called tunnel rats. They gave him a 45 and a flashlight and he went down in the tunnel complex and he said that this thing is really big so he came back out and they brought in bulldozers to clear the land and then they started digging this tunnel complex out and this is one of the weapons that came out of that uh, tunnel complex. But it was a, it was a large uh, cache and I have a large a lot of photographs showing the different weapons that were taken out of there and I have photographs down inside the tunnels showing some of the weapons that were found down inside the tunnels. It's my understanding those tunnels were very extensive all throughout Vietnam. Some of them were miles and miles long. Some of them had mess halls, they had hospitals, they had R&R &R centers and they had been doing this for years and years and years. I think they were probably doing this when the French was there in the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. digging these tunnels. Uh, and how ground. close to your camp was, were these found? How close to your camp? Uh, 13 miles. 13 from miles camp, from your, from your from base, the base camp. camp. Yes. Yes, I, uh, I brought this back. I had to hand carry it back. Of course, you couldn't do it today. There were several of us that had weapons, and I carried it back uh, through the airports. It was in a gun sleeve, of course, and I fired it several times. It's a German Mauser. Uh, it's dated 1940. 
and it's a model 98 Mauser and it's in pretty rough shape but uh, it shoots well. In fact I fired it just a couple months ago and I've got all the paperwork that says that uh, I was able to bring it back and I've got photographs of me with the weapon over there. So it's actually World War II. Yes. World War II weapon. There was World War II, there was World War I uh, weapons there. There was uh, Chinese, there was Czechoslovakian. Uh, when the war started, probably back when the French were there, they used about any weapon that they could get their hands on. A lot of these were World War II surplus. And of course the enemy used this. You know, the military had the, the M1s and the M14s and the M16s for the rifles. But uh, the enemy used just about any weapon that they could get their hands on. And some of them even used bows and arrows during the first part of the war. Mm -hmm. In the early 60s, they had bows and arrows. Yeah, you wouldn't be allowed to take that home now. No, no you wouldn't, no, wouldn't, no, you wouldn't, wouldn't carry you it any place. Uh, there was another friend of mine from Chicago that I kind of buddied up with when we came back, and we both had weapons. And uh, we carried him right through uh, San Francisco International Airport. But at that time, you know, it, uh, it wasn't like it is today. You know, you see somebody carrying a weapon to call the police, but they, like I say, they had to be inside of a sleeve and uh, you couldn't display them or anything. But when we got on the plane in Vietnam to come back, there were stacks of these weapons. They were just stacked up in the corner. You know, the guys would bring them on the plane. And I've talked to several people that brought them back. Most of them still have them. Uh, some of them have sold them and so forth. Uh, a lot of people say they have the weapons, but if you don't have the paperwork that goes with it, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really just another souvenir. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Anything else you'd like to tell us? No, I think that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, there's a lot of other things I'll probably think of after we leave the interview, but uh, it, was a, it was a good time for me. I didn't mind at the time I didn't like being drafted, but uh, as I look back on it, uh, it was probably uh, something that I had to do at the time simply because I was drafted and there was really no other choice and uh, I probably wouldn't want to do it again but uh, it's something that was given to me to do so I bite my lip and, and do what's told. Well, Ms. Foss, well, we really want to we really appreciate you coming and talk to, talking to us. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.